learned a lot about how to work smarter and more effectively, so I suspect we could all use that opportunity. And today she shares a lesson she learned with others to help them uh, to be more successful in their jobs and personal lives through her business, Elevate USA. And with that, I welcome Ellen Engel to the stage. Please welcome, join me in welcoming her. Everybody. Hello. Good morning. Good to see you all. I'm going to step forward a little so the light's on in my eyes so I can see all the people that I met and hope I don't fall off the stage. How many of you have a morning routine? And what I mean by that is you get up in the morning on a work day and you do the same thing every single day. How many of you have that morning routine? You get up in the morning, have your coffee in the same order, get dressed in the same order? Okay. Now, who does it? Who wings it? Any wingers? All right. Wingers, Betty, did you raise your hand as a winger? Okay, you don't have to answer the question. Wingers don't have to answer, but everybody else has to. What happens when something goes wrong with your morning routine? And what I mean is you get up, you go to have your coffee and realize you're out of coffee. You let the dog out, the dog runs away. You got to chase the dog around the neighborhood. Your alarm clock doesn't go off on time. You got to rush to work. How does it make you feel? What does it do? How does your day go? Anybody? It stresses you out. Yeah, what else? Anything else? Throws off, Throws off your day. Makes you feel uncomfortable. Just not right. Something's not right there, right? Okay. That is what happens when something that you're used to doing changes. And I've even had people say they've had to wake up, go through their day having a miserable day because things are just thrown off. They're stressed. They're not really happy. And then they have to go to sleep at night in order to get feel better the next morning. Now, I hope it's not that bad. But that is what happens when a normal routine or a habit gets thrown off course. Now, I don't know whether you know this or not, but the average high school graduate knows 800 people by the time they graduate high school. So you have been networking your whole life by the time you graduate high school. You probably just didn't call it networking. And now what's going to happen today is we're going to talk about ways to promote yourself and ways to network, and they may be different than the ways that you have been doing it now. And so what you're going to do is take a habit that you've had and you're going to change it. And just like your morning routine, when it gets thrown off, makes you feel stressed, makes you feel uncomfortable, makes you feel like this isn't quite right. When you change your networking habits, when you change your habits of promotion, you're going to feel the same way. And if you don't feel comfortable, what do you do? It's okay, you can tell me. What do you do? Yeah, you go back to your old ways because it's easier. So we go to an event like this and we say, okay, I'm going to be a great networker. I'm going to tell people all about myself. I'm going to help people. I'm going to give information. I'm going to do whatever I decide that I'm going to do. But you get there and all of a sudden you freeze and you're not comfortable and things aren't quite right. So you go right back to your old ways. And sometimes those don't work very well. So today we're going to talk about four different ways that work for me when it comes to an event like this, and I'm going to share these with you. And Bruce had mentioned that I'm a lawyer by trade and an entrepreneur by choice. I just want to give you a little background on why I feel that I'm a very good networker and I promote myself very well. I, I did not like being a lawyer, so if there's any lawyers in here, I don't want to insult you, but it wasn't for me. In the last 40 years of my uh, career, what I've done is I've had several successful businesses, and in 2005, I sold my international uh, association. It was a membership networking association, a membership association just like yours, a networking association, but we were international. We had over 20,000 members in over 103 different countries, and I sold it in 2005, but I've gotten a tremendous amount of experience when it comes to promoting myself and to helping others promote themselves. Nowadays, what I do is I'm a professional speaker and a trainer, and I go into organizations like your own, and uh, my trainers go into organizations like yours, and what we do is we teach your employees how to be better employees. We teach you how to be more efficient, how to be more effective, how to be more productive, and how to have generally a better attitude. So there are four things that help me when it comes to the art of self-promotion. The first thing that helps me is I have a really good memory. 
and I work at it. I never had a good memory, but there are memory techniques that you can use so that you can have a good memory. And, and I don't know whether anybody remembers what Dale Carnegie said, but the sweetest sound in the English language is the sound of your name. The sound of your name. So it's important when you go to an event that you have the ability to meet people and remember who they are. And I had a chance to meet some of you, and uh, I, I talked to this table here, Jordan, and Mike, and Amanda, and Kayla, and uh, let's see, I didn't meet the two of you, no I didn't, but Charles, right? Yeah, I met Charles earlier today, and I met Betty, and I met her husband, Carl, right there. Um, I'm not going to go through everybody, it's Rick, right? I met Rick right there, and Mariah, and uh, Alex, and uh, Christian, isn't it, right? Yeah, yeah, nice people. All these people are really, really nice. Um, okay, let's see what we can do here, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a little dark here, so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to remember everybody. But back in the corner, isn't that Larry right there? Okay, good, yeah, nice to meet you, Larry. And uh, Miguel, right? Okay, and uh, other people I met here. I met you, but I don't remember your name. I'm sorry. What is it? Samara. Samara. See, it's okay to ask people what their name is again. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Leslie? And um, by the way, I'm not looking at your name tags all that much. I met you also. Stephen, is it? Mark. Okay, well, sometimes I'm not great at it, but uh, sometimes I'm okay, yeah. It's a little, like said, it's a little dark in here. Is this uh, Demelia? No, it isn't. Where is Demelia? Oh, is oh, okay. All right. All right. Let's see what we got here. Um, oh, gee. Um, um, Leith, isn't it, right? Leith. It's Faith with an L. That's how I remember it, right? All right. And this is Chi Chi, and this is Christine, and this is Sienna Sinera. Sinitra. Sinitra. Okay. Well, I need a little bit more help on that. All right. Um, let's see. Um... Uh, don't tell me it's uh, Ashley and Emma, right? All right, all right, I'm getting there. And uh, some of the others I recognize as well, but you get an idea of what I'm talking about. You should be able to walk into a room, you should be able to meet people, and you should be able to remember their names. So how do you do that? Well, that is another half-day seminar, so we don't have time for that, but that is something that you should learn, and I'm happy to show you that and teach you that when the time comes. What are some of the other things? That's one of the four things that help me when I am coming into an organization, when I'm coming in to do some networking. I like to remember people's names. Now, the other thing that I like to do is I like to be able to explain to people very, very quickly who I am and what I do. Does anybody know what that's called? <laughs> Elevator speech. You all have one, right? Okay. You have 25 seconds to a minute to make an impression on somebody. Can you imagine yourself getting into an elevator, having somebody there that you really wanted to talk to, and they turn around and say, oh, nice to meet you. My name is Ellen. What's your name? And by the way, what do you do in your ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, because that happens all the time. Or what happens is you tell people what you do, but nobody understands it. That happens to me all the time. I mean, it's business speak. And while business speak sounds really good, it makes you sound really smart, if nobody can understand it, what's the point? What's the point? A lot of times we assume that people know what we want, that what we're thinking. And so we skip over important things that it's important for people to know. So I'm going to give you the quick down and dirty on how to do an elevator speech. But before we do that, there's some white pieces of paper on everybody's table. Everybody grab one piece of paper. Y'all need a white piece of paper. Those of you who are back who don't have one, just grab one from another table. All right, here's the ground rules. Here's the ground rules. First of all, do not look at your neighbor. Do not look at your neighbor because you don't know whether your neighbor's going to be right or wrong. Everybody agree to that ground rule? <laughs> Second ground rule, when I give you instructions on what we're going to do, you can't ask me any questions. I'm not going to answer them. So, for example, if I start and I ask, and I asked you to do something, and you say, well, wait a minute, Ellen, I don't understand that. I'm going to totally ignore you. So you don't want that to happen, so don't ask me any questions. <laughs> Everybody agree to the two ground rules. No questions. Don't look at your neighbor. You don't need pens, so put them down. You're all set? <laughs> okay, take that piece of paper and fold it in half. Fold it in half. Don't 
be shy. Fold it in half. <laughs> now what I'd like you to do is find the top right-hand corner of your paper and find the bottom left-hand corner of your paper. And now fold those corners together so they match. You didn't think you were going to be doing origami here, did you? <laughs> All right. Now what I'd like you to do is fold the paper in half again. Fold it in half again. Now find the bottom right-hand corner of your paper <laughs> and tear it off. Aww. That's rip if you don't understand that Boston accent of mine. Thank you. <laughs> All right, once you have ripped off the bottom or right-hand corner, open your papers up. All right. All right, I haven't met anybody at this table, so I don't know your name, so I may have to point. But... Okay, uh, Rachel, could you do me a favor and hold your paper up so everybody can see it? Don't be shy, hold it up. Does everybody see Rachel's paper? She has got two holes like a mask. If you've got two holes like a mask, raise your papers up. Raise your papers up. All right, thank you. The two holers can put their hands down and their papers down. All right. Uh, what's your name? Katie. Katie, hold yours up. Katie has one notch on the bottom, or if you were to turn it around, it would be one notch on the top. If you have one notch, hold your papers up. Hold your papers up. Okay. One notch is thank you. You can hold them down. All right, and you are? Susan. Susan, hold your paper up. Susan has three notches. One here, one here, one here. If you've got three notches like that, two on a corner and one in the middle, hold it up. Okay, thank you. Three notches. Now, um, by the way, uh, could you, Susan, could you hold yours up one more time? Just Susan. Okay. And now, um, what's your name? Talia, could you hold yours up? She's got three notches, but look at how it's different than Susan's. One is sort of uh, horizontal, one is vertical, so it's a little different. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, what's your name? Adam. Adam, could you hold yours up? Adam's got something interesting. He's got one hole and two notches. One hole and two notches. Who's got one hole and two notches? Raise it, raise it up. All right. All right, great, great. All right, Mark, hold yours up. Mark has one hole. Anybody have one hole? Hold it up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, one holers. Okay. Anything? Anything else we haven't seen? Hold it up. We haven't seen it. Okay. What do you have there? Uh, what's your name, first of all? What's that? McKinney. Okay. McKinley. McKinley. Okay, like the mask, right? All right. Hold it up. McKinley has two notches on each corner. Anybody have that? Two notches on each corner. No, McKinley. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we got, we got somebody. All right. All right. What do we have here? Hold it up. We have two notches on the side, not on any corners. And what was your name? Chuck. Chuck. Okay, hold it up again, Chuck. Anybody have what Chuck has? <coughs> All right. Actually, you don't. You have the castle. I like the castle. Okay, <laughs> Shelly, hold it up. Okay, Shelby. Shelby, right? Okay, Shelby has, like, it's like a castle. There we go. Okay. All right, so here's my question. That was fun, wasn't it? Here's my question. You all have the same size piece of paper. You all got the same exact instructions. But look at all of the um, responses that we had. What happened? What happened? You interpreted it differently. Okay, anybody else have anything to say? What was that? You were creative. Okay, what else? Anything else? What was that that I heard back there? Are you saying my instruction stunk? <laughs> yeah, you know, if we were in New York right now, they'd be balling up the paper and throwing it at me because my instructions did stink. Uh, I assumed that you knew which way to hold the paper and orient it. I assumed you knew what was in my mind. By the way, those of you who had two holes, you know, like the mask, that's, what I, that's the way it came out when I did it. All the time it comes out that way. So you think like me. 
But I assumed that everybody else thought like me too. If you actually go to speak to somebody and you want to let people know who you are and what you do, and you're not clear about it, they can walk away thinking something totally different. Do not let people assume. So the first thing with your elevator speech that you want to do is you want to make sure that it is very specific. Now you heard my elevator speech. The other thing about an elevator speech is it has to be compelling. After you give your elevator speech, people have to ask you for more. Now what is an elevator speech? Does anybody know why it's called an elevator speech? Long enough to... Uh... Long enough to make that impression within an elevator ride. Yeah, you have a short period of time, and, and the rule of thumb is if you can make that impression from the time you get on a first floor of the elevator <laughs> to the fifth floor of an elevator, then it's a good elevator speech. But you've got to remember one thing. Most people don't remember this. When people are getting off at that fifth floor, they have to also be able to, the, the elevator speech has to be so compelling that you're, they're actually going to say, wait, don't go yet, tell me more. That's what's important. So I gave you my little elevator speech. I'm a, a lawyer by trade, entrepreneur by um, choice. Didn't like being a lawyer. Now what I do is I go into people's businesses and I help them be their employees be better employees. If you were uh, in an elevator with me, or if I had you as a captive audience, let's say in an airline seat next to me or something like that, think about where you can get people in captive audiences. This is a good time for your elevator speech. You give it. Now, if people are not interested, then they go back to reading their book or standing like this in the elevator. Or they'll ask you, wait, tell me more. Your elevator speech is not meant to give lots of information. Your elevator speech is meant to give a little bit of information, and it needs to be compelling enough to get people into a conversation. So think about your elevator speech. Now, it's hard to do. Your elevator speech is going to be no more than a minute long. And really, if you can keep it shorter than that, you're going to be even better. If you can keep your elevator speech to 30, 40 seconds, you're going to be golden. So how do we do that? How do we take the essence of who we are and what we do, and how do we put it into a short speech like that? That's maybe two or three sentences. So I'm going to give you the quick down and dirty on how you write an elevator speech. It's pretty easy. Difficult to do, I will tell you that right now, and you're going to work on your elevator speech constantly. What your elevator speech is today is going to change based on what you do, what you're trying to accomplish, what you want people to know about you, and you'll get better and better at it. So I need to tell you, I have a son named Zach, and he's 26 years old, but when he was in high school, he only wanted to go to NYU. That was the school. He didn't want to go to any other school, and he only wanted to go to the Tisch School for the Arts. He wanted to go into writing. One of the things he needed was an essay, not the typical essay that you, most colleges ask for, but besides his portfolio, his writing portfolio, they needed an essay that was going to count for 25 points on whether he was accepted or not. So one day he calls me. Now all of you know, by the way, if you get a phone call from your kids when they're that age, there's something wrong. <laughs> I knew there was something wrong. I'm like, what's wrong, Zach? And he says, Mom, he says, I just got this, the topic for my for my writing, for my essay from NYU. I said, okay, tell me what it is. He says, it tell, the essay is, tell us why you want to live in New York, but don't tell us it's the greatest city in the world. You guys boo, right? Yeah, I know, okay. But that was what the essay was. And I'm like, Zach, you can write this. This is really easy. And he says, mom, here's the kicker. 50 words or less. What's he supposed to, what is that? It's an elevator speech, exactly. He's like, I can't do it. And I said, sure you can. So what I did was I gave him the steps that I'm giving you right now to write an elevator speech. And the first step I gave him is write it as if you have no limitation on what you want to say about yourself. So he wrote a 250-word essay on why he wants to live in New York. And it was really good. And I want you to know at that time I was living on the beach in North Carolina. I don't know whether any of you know a small island called Topsail Island. It's out in the middle of nowhere, it's beautiful and everything, but boy, I wanted to go to the city after reading that essay. And uh, that's how good it was. I said, that really, really good, but it's a little too long. Cut it in half. Now, it took him one hour to write the first essay. It took him three hours to cut it in half. And basically what he did is he took out extra adverbs, adjectives, extra words. For example, you don't have to say at the present time, you can say now. You don't have to say, think about it. Uh, 
we tend to write using a lot of words and we don't need to. We tend to talk sometimes so it makes us sound like we're smarter and we don't need to. We need to get the information out. So we cut it in half and he had a really, really good essay of 124 words. But it was still too many words. So I said, you've got to cut it in half again. Now, he actually had to start thinking about, out of everything I have here, what is important and what do I really want to say about living in New York? And that's what you do with your elevator speech. It took him one week to cut it in half, and he ended up with a wonderful essay of 54 words. Four words too much. It took him three weeks to reword it and pick everything till it became 49 words. He got into NYU, he's since graduated, and uh, it's probably one of the best things he's written, and he's got a book getting ready to be uh, uh, published, and he's got a screenplay that he has won many prizes. So he really worked at it, and he really did a good job on that. And the essence of his speech was, I want to live in New York because I want to look out the window at 3 o'clock in the morning and know, even if I don't want to be out there, that things are happening. That was the essence. That's what he came up with. So think to yourself, what do you want people to know about you? What do you want people to know about what you do? And you may need three or four elevated speeches. You may need one for your social life, like when you go out to a place like this and you meet people. You may need it for your business life because you need to tell people about what you do for business. You need to think about what the situations are that you're going to need an elevated speech. And remember, short, sweet, to the point, but it has to be compelling so that when people are stepping off that fifth floor, they'll say, wait, come with me, I need to know more. That's an elevated speech. So each and every one of you should have one. That, knowing names, having a good memory, having an elevated speech, two things that have made a huge difference when it comes to networking, when it comes to promoting myself. Now, what's the third one? Yeah, I told you there were four. Four. <laughs> you got to be able to count, right? Okay, what's the third one? The third one is know how to make a connection. How do we make a connection? Well, when I'm going to an event or I'm going to meet people, I come up with five different topics, depending on where I'm going, things I can talk about so that I can make a connection. An interesting thing happened to me at the air, uh, on the airlines the other day. I travel a lot, uh, and because I travel a lot, I get upgraded to first class all the time. So I'm sitting, yeah, I know, it's pretty nice. I, I'm, I'm sitting with people who um, are, are either my peers, business people who do, do a lot of traveling, or really rich people who can afford first class. And I, I, I come in, and my assigned seat's next to this woman. And again, we make, uh, you know, impressions are made instantly almost. And I sit next to this woman, and oh, she is gorgeous. She is gorgeous. She is just gorgeous. She's older, about my age. And she has on designer clothes. She just looks perfect. There's not a hair out of place. She doesn't have a wrinkle on her. I'm like, boy, her and I will never get along. <laughs> It's just my initial thought. So I sat down, and I didn't really talk to her or look at her or anything. And at, the plane takes off, and we're, we're flying. I was coming from Fort Lauderdale to D.C., and all of a sudden, something jumps in my lap, and I'm like, oh, what's that? That's a little, little dog. She had a little dog on her lap, like underneath a little blanket I didn't even see. <laughs> and so I turned around to say something to her. I love dogs. And guess what? We got into a conversation. Somebody who I never would have given the time of day to, for whatever reason, I just made that decision, and we start talking. And then we find out we have something else in common. Her husband is um, just recovering from a liver transplant. Well, at that time, my husband was waiting for a liver transplant. This woman has become such a good friend. She, when my husband went for his transplant, which, by the way, he's done really well, but when he, she walked, she stayed with me every step of the way because she knew what was happening. And now we've become friends. And she has just hooked my son up with a writer, comedy writer, from Hollywood, who she happens to be friends with. So all of a sudden, the networking has started because we had a connection. So what is the connection? Well, I, again, five things I need to have that I can talk about when I go to an event. I look to see if I can listen and learn from people. And I look to see if I can give information and resources. Because if you give information and resources, people think about you when they need something. So have some knowledge and, and have some, and some information and resources and listen to people. It's not always about promoting yourself. I'm this, I'm great, I'm everything. It's about 
putting yourself into a situation where you have the knowledge that people are going to want to come back to you. So see if you can learn a little bit. I like to know a little bit about a lot of things. And how do I learn a little bit about a lot of things? Half hour every day when I'm getting dressed, I listen to TV. When I'm in a hotel room, I pull that USA Today and I just scan through it. I don't read the whole thing. I don't listen. I'm not really looking for politics or, or what, uh, unless maybe I'm in Washington. Because most other places, people really don't want to talk about politics, religion, money, that kind of thing. But I'm looking for trivia. Here's a perfect example. I was sitting at, in the airport. My, um, my cell phone battery was running low, so I didn't want to read my book. I have a Kindle on my book. So I'm sort of sitting there thinking to myself, oh, what am I going to do? My plane's delayed. And some fellow sits next to me, and he's in a uniform, and he's a TSA agent. Our favorite people. And uh, I'm like, well, i got nothing to do. Let me strike up a conversation with him. So we struck up a conversation, and I was able to strike up a conversation because that day I had read, and this was quite a few years ago, that day I had read in USA Today that Delta Airlines was going to be testing the um, boarding passes on your cell phone, you know, so you could bring your smartphone. And I looked at him and I said, I just read that. How are you going to do that? Are you going to have special machines? And before I knew what we were talking, and I wanted to know, I now train the TSA agents at John F. Kennedy Airport because I struck up a conversation with this guy. I wasn't looking to get any business. I was actually looking to amuse myself till my plane left. But if you have information, knowledge, you look like you know what you're doing, then all of a sudden people want to know you and people want to talk to you. So make a connection. Learn something. Learn a little bit about a lot of things. Have five questions, five pieces of information you can bring to a place. And always be listening. Always be listening. And that's not so easy to do, is it? Listening? Let me ask you some questions. I want you to be really honest. Everybody promise to be honest? Okay. When your boss asks you to do a new project, how many of you are thinking about how you're going to implement it while your boss is still talking? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay. How many of you, when somebody is asking you a question, are already thinking about how you're going to answer that question before the question is fully asked? Be honest. Come on. Okay. How many of you, when you're having a conversation, does a word trigger something in your mind? Let me see if I can explain. It happened to me the other day. I'm sitting and I'm talking to somebody. We're having a conversation about business, but somewhere the word piano comes in. And my mind all of a sudden starts having a whole conversation on its own. <laughs> I wonder if my piano teacher, when I was 10 years old, is still alive. I wonder if she's still teaching piano. Life. So that is, again, another way, something else that gets in the way of listening. Let, let's, let's, do, um, let's do one more. Oh, let's do, yeah, let's do one more because Valentine's Day is coming up. How many of you have ever sat at a table with somebody who's special to you, maybe a significant other or somebody who's just special? You're looking in each other's eyes and you're speaking sweet nothings to each other. You're holding each other's hand. But you know, the table behind you, that couple's having a juicy fight and you're listening to that too. <laughs> Those things happen, right? That is why our listening skills are not so good. The, that's what's called noise, listening noise. And it gets in the way. The reason it gets in the way, I'm just going to give you this quick fact. The reason that it gets in the way is our mind, well, let me, let me give you this fact first. We can process, no matter how fast somebody talks, where they can be understood. And I'm not talking about like an auctioneer. Blah, 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 blah. I'm talking about being understood. The fastest we can speak is 150 words a minute. To be understood. But our mind can process 500 words a minute. So what do you think our mind's doing while it's waiting for the speech to catch up? It's daydreaming. It's planning. It's doing everything else. So when you're coming into a situation where you want to promote yourself, you want to network, it's going to be difficult because your mind doesn't like you. I'm telling you right now, your mind doesn't like you. And because your mind doesn't like you, it's not going to allow you to listen as effectively as you could. So while you're learning to make a connection, you've also got to learn to be a better listener. Again, that's another whole half-day seminar. But you can Google those kind of things now. The Internet's a wonderful thing. And you can learn what are some of the things that you can do to become a better listener. I'll give you the one key that I use. I actually get involved in the conversation, ask questions, so that I'm not, my mind's not, you're having a chance 
to go anywhere. And, and as long as I do that, I'm a better listener. And as long as I'm a better listener, then I know how to make that connection. So now we want to have a good memory. We want to learn people's names. We want to learn a little bit about them. Where do they work? What's important to them? What are the goals? We want to be able to have an elevated speech that's going to be clear and concise and compelling enough so people are going to want to know more about us and talk to us and make that connection. And then we're going to want to make the connection. Now, the last thing that I do that really works well for me is I actually took a lesson from uh, George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush. Do you know that um, he carried a box of thank you notes around with him? Like blank thank you notes. And he wrote thank you notes constantly. Now think about the last time you got a handwritten note. Anybody get a handwritten note recently? Okay. So some of you have. We don't get many of them, though, do we? And when I get a handwritten note, I don't know about you, but for me, I pay attention. Because I don't get that. Usually I get emails. Sometimes I'll get a letter that's typed. But a handwritten note is something special. And I started to take a lesson. And when I go to an event and I meet people I want to connect with, I make sure I follow it up with a handwritten note. That handwritten note gets my name back in front of people, and it's not the same as sending an email saying, oh, it was really nice to meet you. It's different. It's different for everybody when you get a handwritten note. They say that George H.W. Bush probably won the election because of his handwritten notes. If you look into the history and, and of the election and everything, he would write a note to everybody. One thing is, if you have one of those, probably not worth that much because he signs so many of those notes. But the fact of the matter is, is it makes impressions. So think about how am I going to follow up with people? Follow up is part of promoting. And there's lots of different ways to follow up. But one of the best ways is a handwritten note. Now, I can go on and on with lots of different things you need to think about. But what I've done is I have put together a booklet for you called The Art of Self-Promotion. And if you drop your business card into the um, hopper, wherever it is, uh, over here, all right? Um, back over there, I can't see who's there. Ahmed's there, right? Raise your hand, Ahmed. Let us know. Yeah, okay. Um, just drop your business card in before you leave, and we will email you the copy of The Art of Self-Promotion. No charge or anything else. The Art of Self-Promotion will give you 10 more ideas on how to promote yourself. Pick the ones that you want. Remember, it's hard to start a new habit. So don't take everything and try to put it into place at once. Instead, you want to pick one or two things. Put those into practice. Now, how many days does it take to make a habit? Does anybody know? 21. 21, exactly. We've got some smart people in here. All right, 21 days to make a habit. You know, we have two parts of our brain. We have the conscious part of our brain and the subconscious part of our brain. The conscious part of our brain is the part of our brain that says, hey, we just learned something new. If we take this and we put it into action, What's going to happen is we're going to be better at what we do. But then there's the subconscious part of our brain. That's the part of our brain that says, we don't need to do this. Look at us. We're doing just fine without it. Why do we need to work so hard? Why do we need to do it? And that's why whenever we learn something new that might help us, a lot of times we get started with it. And once we get started with it, we're like, oh, this doesn't feel so good. Sort of like that breaking of the morning routine. And we go back to our old ways. If you'd like to take any of these techniques, the four I gave you, or some of the other ones that are going to be in the booklet that you're going to get, take one or two and put them into practice for how many days? 21 days. At the end of 21 days, what happens is, for some reason, let me just show you this real quick. Your conscious and your subconscious mind are always at war with each other. And usually, your subconscious mind wins. It pushes that conscious mind away. But in 21 days, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why, your subconscious mind all of a sudden embraces the new idea. I love this. <laughs> it doesn't try to push it away anymore. And then you actually have a technique that you can use. So how many of you will make a commitment to yourselves? You can't make it to me because I'm not going to see you tomorrow or next week. Although I hope to bump into you again and maybe even do some business with you. 
How many of you will make a commitment to yourselves to take one or two of these ideas or the ideas in the booklet that you're going to get and put them into practice for 21 days? You'll do yourself a favor. Trust me, it really, really works. Now, one day, I had a professor. When I was in college, I went to BU, Boston University, and I had a pro professor who was teaching marketing. And the first day of the class, he walked in. He was a, an older man, and uh, he, was, he, he, he walked in, and he had this big box he is struggling to carry in. And he gets to the front of the room, and it's like he can barely hold it anymore, and he drops it, and it breaks open. And there are thousands upon thousands of business cards in there. And the first thing he said is, this is a class on marketing and promotion, and I'm going to tell you right now, do not give out your business card, collect business cards. There are so many times we go to events like this, we collect lots and lots of business cards, but more we're more concerned about giving out our business cards so people will call us. Be honest, how many people actually call you? I can tell you right now, nobody. <laughs> Unless they really, really want your service. Now, they may really need it, but they don't really want it. You've got to tell them why they need it, and they will never call you to say, tell me why. So if you give out your business cards, then you're really just wasting your time. Instead, collect them. Put a little note on the back of each one about the conversation you had with the person. And then follow up. Because networking and promotion is all about follow up. And I'm happy to follow up with you. If you have any questions, uh, just drop your card in for the Art of Self-Promotion. It will have my name my email address, and my telephone number. And I know I've collected a lot of cards from some of you, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting in touch with some of you. If you have a need in your organizations for your employees to be better at a lot of different things, I talked to a number of people, tour guides, uh, okay, Alex right here. I do a lot of tour guide training in Chicago for the Architectural uh, Association. I do a lot of training for the Mural Arts Program in Philadelphia. You need to, uh, somebody who's going to teach a little bit more about promotion, networking, communication, leadership, business writing, computer skills. By the way, I don't do that. I have somebody who does that, <laughs> but it's great. Any of these things, I'm your person, my company is your person. I look forward to keeping in touch with all of you, and remember, collect those business cards. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, one more round of applause for Ellen. I'm going to come up here. So I know um, we're ending a few minutes early with the intent to give you some chance to network accordingly in the room.